Hey everyone, sorry for the smart, the small delay there. We were just fixing some internet issues um, and now it should be working. So um, we've been talking today about everything around remote work. We need a, bit, a good umbrella of topics, onboarding, productivity, operation, and inclusiveness. But we didn't really talk about the impact, and we talked a little bit about it, but about the impact of remote work on employees. And this is what Tom is going to talk to us about today. Tom Wilmot is the CEO of Human Made, the one who is organizing this event, and he's going to talk to us about uh, stress in remote teams and what he's been seeing in the team as um, different patterns that happen and how to solve stress problems. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Tom to the screen. Hey, welcome. Hey, hey Daphne, good to be here. Hey. I hope my uh, so, Wi-Fi holds up. Yeah, if anything, maybe because it's hotel Wi-Fi, uh, if anything, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it um, while you are online, so no worries, and you can switch and everything. So I'm going to hide myself now. Again, everyone, if you have any questions to ask them, please go ahead and ask them in the Q&A section, and we'll, I'll answer them, we'll answer them at the end of the, the session. So I'm going to hide myself now. Have a good one, Tom. Cool, awesome. So do my slides show up? How do I, I don't see my slides on the screen. How do I get those on Daphne? Oh, there we go. Awesome. But then I just, I just had to put them in. It's, it's there now. That's cool. I got it. Awesome. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about um, some of the stress factors that we've run into at Human Made over the years um, and kind of focusing on the ones that we think are unique to remote teams. There's a lot of stress factors in traditional working um, and a lot of those actually are still relevant in remote teams. Um, but, uh, you know, so they're important to know about and, and uh, think about, but they're not going to be what I'm going to be talking about today. This is kind of mostly born out of our experience, building uh, kind of a 40 person uh, company over the past six or so years. Um, we initially started out, uh, like as Daphne touched on in some of the introduction, all sat in the same office um, in, a, in, a, in a small town in Matlock. Um, and then we've transitioned to being remote quite early on, uh, I think around when we were six or seven people. Uh, and then yeah, our, our growth has been fairly quick over, over that kind of five years or so that we've then been remote. In addition to our own experience, we've also been doing uh, just this past kind of six months to eight months. We've been doing some pretty interesting research with uh, a lady called Catalina, um, a master's student at, based out in Spain, um, who was doing some research into stress in remote teams as part of her thesis um, for, for a master's course in psychology, um, which was like a, she, she, Catalina actually approached us um, uh, and, and kind of joined our team and, and uh, took part in our culture and, and uh, you know, we, we kind of in return took part in a bunch of questionnaires and, and other kinds of forms of research. Um, and so that was kind of a super interesting process for us to go through as a team and taught us a lot, I think, about ourselves and our, our, our internal structures and processes and how those were, were contributing to, to some of the um, stress factors, uh, you know, that, that, that were kind of, uh, you know, affecting us as a company. Um, and it definitely kind of amazed us just, just through talking to Catalina, kind of how little published research there is on this topic. Um, like workplace stress in general seems quite well understood and there are like health and safety guidelines covering most of that. But, but once you jump onto some of the, the stuff that's unique to remote teams, um, there's much less of that. Um, and also for me, just more generally, um, like a lot of the like literature and, and presentations uh, and, and kind of talk around remote teams is often often kind of focuses on the positive aspects understandably right we're trying to we're, you know we really believe in in remote working uh, as, a, as a force for good and as a better way to do business and so inevitably we're trying to sell it when we're talking about it um, but it's not all plain sailing clearly there's there's challenges with remote work um, and we've definitely run into you know all of those and I'm sure we'll continue to run into more as we you know go forward um, so this is um, us back in, uh, in the early days, you know, quite a small group. Um, and we weren't actually remote, um, you know, when we started, as I said, small town in, in, in the middle of England, we were all sat in this office. Um, unfortunately, it didn't have a very big tech scene. And so uh, we kind of figured, hey, we're going to need to move the company somewhere else with a larger talent pool, or we're going to need to start hiring remotely. Um, and so going remote was actually quite natural for us. We'd grown up in like the open source community. Um, WordPress to be specific, which is obviously remote by design, thousands of people um, over the life of the project from all kind of corners of the world contributing um, 
So a lot of the like tools and processes uh, and structures are around just how you work effectively remotely, we were already pretty familiar with. Um, and also, although we were UK based, almost all of our clients in the early days were in the US. And so again, we were quite used to just like dealing with time zone differences and communicating online and asynchronously. And so we kind of made that switch pretty quickly. Uh, we hired an engineer out in Portland, another in Brazil, um, and we brought in a third partner based in Switzerland. Um, and then also kind of as, as well as hiring those additional people, everyone in the office kind of move away too. So we had a bunch of people just switch to working from home locally. Uh, someone moved out to Australia, someone else to Leeds, um, until it, you know, it, it got to the point where there was really only me and one other sat in the office. Um, and you know, even then I, I like to build a home office and now work from home most of the time. Um, and I think it's something uh, you know, I've heard, heard discussed a few times in, in some of the, the, the sessions today is, is this importance of like going all in on route if you're going to do it, whether you do say, stay sat together or not, kind of you've got to go all in on the, on the processes and communication kind of uh, like structures that you have. Um, and you know, we kind of definitely did that. Uh, here's uh, another, another kind of team photo from, from another one of our retreats, this one uh, in Slovakia this past June. Um, Something I think that, that, that um, has helped us in, in, this, in, in terms of like running into all these challenges that I'm gonna talk about, it's just that we've, from the early days, we've been quite extremely remote actually. Um, we've kind of people spread across like almost the widest time zone gap you've had. We've got people in, in New Zealand and, and Tasmania and Australia um, on the one side and then you know, all the way to the west coast of the US on the other and, and with a pretty kind of good spread in between um, as well. Um, and so, you know, it, we're not just dealing with like a couple of hours of time zone difference uh, or, or, you know, a, a, a kind of cross continent flight to meet up. We're dealing with, with like 12 to 20 hour time zone differences and, and uh, you know, f flying to meet up is, is a pretty big undertaking. Cool, okay, enough kind of context out of the way, <laughs> getting to some of the, the, the kind of fundamentals of work um, and how they just in themselves directly lead to some unique challenges. And as we switched from being in the same office um, to now being quite extremely distributed, I think across five, five continents, uh, you know, we've got people uh, spread across. We, we've like had to tackle a lot of these ourselves. So the first, uh, the, this, this kind of lack of awareness that you can end up with um, when you're working remotely, of just like the local context of, of your coworkers' lives. So, when you're working with someone remotely and you're just interacting with them online, you're pretty likely to be quite unaware of, of their local situation. Like simple things like just the weather or things like the political climate, customs, norms in, in, from, from wherever they're from. And uh, also just like personal things like their, their family context, uh, their, their, their personal context. Stuff that like inevitably you just get to know quite quickly in an office based culture because you're, you know, you're chatting to them, you're seeing them um, and you can pick up on a lot of this stuff or you share it with them directly. And, and I definitely run into this quite a bit, and especially in the context of, of measuring output. Um, and definitely just this kind of realization, I suppose, that more output isn't always good and comparing yourself, like work, if you work for a remote company, comparing your own output with that of another person's, like purely just on the amount of output, without like an understanding of the different contexts of your, like your personal situation and whoever you're comparing yourselves to personal situation, can lead to, to quite a few issues. Um, the, mo the most obvious just being these kinds of uh, things around like imposter syndrome and a feeling of inadequacy. And that's something like I've, uh, we've definitely experienced a lot at Human Made and I've, you know, talking to founders of other remote companies seems quite common too. Um, so like if you have family commitments, you're not a workaholic, you've got responsibilities outside of work and active social life, like good at balancing work and life, you might well feel pretty inadequate working remotely with someone for whom like work is the majority of their life or, or um, who doesn't have any of those other commitments because you're just purely like uh, comparing your output with their output. And you don't really, you're not able to see the, the other differences in each of your lives that like might explain that. And I think it, it maybe it's like a, you know, a mistake of human nature that when we're making that comparison, we often assume that the other person's life must be similar to ours, but that somehow they're just able to do more. 
um, which is like never the case. There, are, it's rarely to do with you know individual productivity, and, and often to do with much more with your your different life setup, right? Um, so if you're physically working with a workaholic, like you can see them coming to the office early whilst you have to do the school run, or you notice them staying late while you get to go out and meet friends, and so you can more easily like factor in these downsides um, of like giving up some of those aspects of your life in in order to to maybe get that additional additional output or whatever um, that you know that you're comparing yourself uh, to. I think also this difficulty in comparing like solely based on output along with some of the other difficulties um, that are just kind of more generally associated with flat autonomous organizational structures uh, lead, can lead to a lot of anxiety um, and, and this feeling of imposter syndrome. Um, and, and you know, I've noticed this a bunch inside human made, especially with new starters, um, like uh, through my one to one chats that I do with everyone like i've noticed that most people in the company feel like they're inadequate to some in some way um uh, which you know everyone in the company can't be below average uh compared to the rest of the company but but it, it, people tend to to end up feeling that way um it's not uncommon for newer humans and, and i know uh, talking to some to other companies too that you know i've heard similar things that people have this like fear uh, you know, a fear I can say is quite irrational, but this fear of, of just being fired at, like at any moment for not being good enough. Um, there's also this sense that with all of your communication being out in the open and all of the like work that we do being very easily measurable on, on GitHub or or on or on Slack or on uh, Basecamp, um, people can just feel like they're always being judged. Like it's it's quite difficult to like, hide away and and like do your work. Uh, everything's out in the open. Uh, everything is it, it, like naturally comparable, um, and so this sense of just always being judged. Uh, you know, how, how do you have a down day in that kind of environment? Um, also, I guess in this social media age, it's more generally that we live in, there's this tendency to try and present like the best of ourselves online. We have this like digital persona, um, and I think this carries over also into our work. We have this like remote work persona. Um, which inevitably just further exacerbates these issues because you're again like that persona probably hides some of the uh, le less uh, uh, kind of glamorous uh, sides to to uh, you know being productive uh, or working remotely. It's also kind of just human nature to compare like the best features uh, of everybody in your circle with with you. So you kind of create this superhuman out of the best bits of everyone else. Oh, I'm not as good at time keep uh, time tracking as this one, other one person, I'm not as good at writing code as this other person, I'm not as good at communicating and GitHub issues as this other person, and you create this like mega person that then inevitably you're gonna you know, fall short uh, of in some, some aspect. Um, there's also kind of this disconnect potentially between actual work done and a person's ability to kind of communicate that work. Like I think often we, we talk about measuring output in remote companies, but in reality, more often than not, you're measuring people's ability to just communicate uh, about, the out, about their output. Um, like sure, you can go and measure kind of lines of code written or number of people who've used the feature that's been built or something, um, but often uh, uh, the success or the perceived success of work especially when there hasn't really been time to assess how well it, 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 its impacts, say, you know, in, in a greater sense on, on the product or, or on its goals, um, is often just, is often more about like how well that person markets that internally or markets the work they've done. Um, so you can end up with, with, with people who uh, are not very good at, at kind of sharing how much great work they've done and, and other people who are really good at sharing like what is actually quite a modest amount of work. Something else I see uh, like contributing to this kind of feelings of inadequacy and, and imposter syndrome, um, and I think isn't unique necessarily to remote companies in particular, but, but goes hand in hand with remote companies because lots of remote companies also have like flat architectures and uh, 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 structures and and, uh, and and a lot of this other kind of uh, modern working practices. Um, and that, the, the kind of lack of direction and clear feedback that's quite common in those environments, especially in the early days while you're still figuring that out. Um, definitely just leaves newer people not really knowing whether what they're doing is right uh, and just again adds to that sense of, of worry uh, that, that they're missing something or that everyone else knows something that they don't um, and, and uh, you know thus that, that ultimately they could, they're going to be fired for that or, or that you know they're miserable in some way. 
so some of the kind of things that are then uh, have worked for us in, in, in kind of fighting against all of that. Um, uh, and th th this, you know, has been kind of core, I think, to Human Made since, since right at the beginning, you know, so it's a big part of why I wanted to build a company. Um, and, and that's just like encouraging the people who work at Human Made to just bring their whole selves to, to work. Um, there's no like professional and, and side to, to, to the people at Human Made that they need to present internally. We want to, you know, know each other well. And, and being remote, you kind of have to like, similar to how you have to overcompensate uh, on the communication side, you have to overcompensate on this side too. Um, so we, we encourage people to bring their whole selves, like warts and all, just simple things online. Like we have Slack rooms, lots of non-related work stuff, you know, that people can hang out in, chat about kids, challenges, talk about politics, attend book, have book clubs. Um, and also uh, like things like in-person meetups, conferences, family days out, that kind of stuff all helps to just like break down uh, that, that disconnect between each other's uh, like local contexts and, uh, and, and uh, help people just better see that like everyone is human, right? And uh, you know, all of the challenges you have in your life are, are probably broadly similar to the challenges other people are having, um, or at least they have an equal amount of challenge in their life, um, even if those challenges are different. Um, so that's kind of, you know, it, it, a little bit airy-fairy perhaps, um, and, and I think it's something that just has to pervade like everything you do, um, but it's something I think is super important. Something just a little more practical um, is this idea of, of like eschewing fixed teams, and uh, I had Jason touch on this a little bit with this, you know, small teams inside Basecamp, um, and I, you know, I imagine every six weeks those are kind of uh, reforming um, around new projects kind of in a transient way. Um, Similar, similarly at Human Made, um, what's quite, we're, we're a client services company, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, majorly, and although we do uh, have some product stuff too and event stuff like this. Um, but what's quite common at a lot of agencies is they'll have like fixed delivery teams. So, you know, maybe you've got a project manager and some developers and a designer and, and, and what have you. And then those teams kind of build up a real strong sense of identity and they stay together for, you know, for a long time and, and deliver projects. Uh, we don't do that. Instead, we, we have uh, just teams uh, coming together around projects as needed, um, you know, based on what people are interested in, what, what, whether they're available, that kind of thing. Um, the feeling here again is it's just like this exposes people to just a greater range of people right like you're getting to work with more people ideally you're getting to work with everyone in human made eventually um and so you get to see like different output levels different styles of working um ideally this then just leads to um humans realizing quickly uh, like as quickly as possible that there are just lots of ways to be good at your job um and you're not always just comparing yourself to, like the same few people it also helps to avoid teams becoming like overly competitive with each other. Something I definitely have seen um, inside companies with fixed teams is that there ends up being like a hierarchy of teams in, internally. And then, again, that can lead to like stress and anxiety and, and, and the other like negative side effects. Like maybe you feel like you're the best person in your team and you're held back by everyone else, or you know, you're jealous of this other team who seems to get all the interesting projects or what have you. Um, and, and so again, just having this like very fluid uh, approach to teams helps avoid a lot of that. Um, well, one potential downside there, I think, is, you know, in, in maybe a much larger company than ours, ha having those small teams does really then allow people to feel a closer sense of identity to something, uh, which maybe you've, you know, they've lost just by the company that they're a part of being so large. Um, and so I can imagine in that kind of situation, maybe you would want kind of larger groups or something that have an identity that you can buy into with then transient sub teams internally. Um, and we're already kind of heading down that path where like, um, you know, there's less like toing and froing now between agency and product and, 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 and events. And instead, those kinds of groups are now fairly fixed. And there's just uh, transients within the sub teams of those groups. Um, so that, you know, something that could work. Um, another pretty obvious solution and, and something I see like most remote companies doing these days, uh, meeting up in person is just a huge part of running a successful remote team. Uh, you know, obvious misnomer that just because you're remote doesn't, you know, should mean that you don't ever meet up. Um, so we typically have like a whole company meet up per year, uh, you know, again, very standard. Um, and then with like a, a bunch of just smaller ad hoc get togethers uh, alongside, like running throughout the year, often like around attending a conference or meeting up just to co-work, maybe at the kickoff of a client project or around launch. 
uh, traveling to visit a client, often people will kind of travel for some purpose and then maybe they'll get an Airbnb and stay for another few days um, just to, to, to hang out, work together, see the sites, what have you. Again, meeting up person allows you to see just the other sides of people. Um, inevitably, you're kind of living together for a few days. Um, something we found to be hugely important is, is this kind of, as you're communicating online with that person after you've met up with them, you then like interpret their online communication in their voice and with their kind of mannerisms. And it, it really, really helps um, you like understand the, the like meaning and tone that that message was sent in which is like a huge problem uh, generally with, with online communication. Uh, you, normally that side of things is all lost. And so, you know, the more you can like meet up and have conversations with someone in real life, I think the less of an impact that has. Something else we've continued to do on our meetups ever since we've, we, we started um, is, is kind of everyone in the company does like a five minute uh, like lightning talk, flash talk um, or what have you. Um, Ideally, again, on non-work topics, and you know, just another avenue to bring in kind of non, the non-work side of our lives uh, and our personalities. Um, and and, and uh, you know, they're always like, a lot of fun. Um, and, and and something that I've always liked about them is this kind of sense of of like us all being together as a team in kind of like a, a safe space. And you know, as each kind of individually getting up and just showing a little bit of vulnerability. It, it, in front of each other like it, it's pretty nerve-wracking especially if you're new to kind of get up and deliver a, a talk you know especially if you're not at all into public speaking like uh, that, that itself can be a stressful thing to do um but so far for me like that's always way been outweighed with the sense of uh, uh, of kind of um togetherness um and like shared experience that everyone then has like after the the, the we've done the flash talks you know everyone kind of comes out of those on a bit of a high. Um, so I've always really liked that. Um, so kind of, you know, kind of a, a trend here, I suppose, is, is that like for every time, every time we come up with, with a solution for some, for some issues we're running into, inevitably that solution itself just then throws up a whole, whole new load of challenges and you, and you just kind of, you know, you, you, you go through the cycle again. Um, and meetups, um, definitely in our early days, like as a company, again, people were talking very positively about, about meetups. It seemed obvious to us that we would have to do them uh, that, or that we should do them. Um, and um, I'm just being pink saying I'm, uh, uh, how much time I've got left. So I'm going to run a little bit quicker because uh, I want to want to get through all these slides. Um, so yeah, some, some of the challenges that we then ran into with meetups. Um, so uh, one quite obvious one that isn't talked about often is just that people actually, can actually be quite different in person, these online. Um, so you might just find that like everyone doesn't get along in person, um, which can just be a bit of a shock, I think, if you, you know, you might just not be expecting that at all. Um, and you know, you just have to kind of accept that, that's totally okay. Um, it's one of the benefits of being remote, right? Is that you, you know, that, that doesn't affect you for the rest of the year. Um, just, just like traveling to meetups, people getting the time out of their lives to be able to travel. Um, you know, again, when we were very small, it was very, very easy. We were all just young and didn't really have any other responsibilities. We could easily travel, spend a week together. Um, as we've grown as a company, people have got kids, just much more challenging to, um, to get that time uh, to, to be able to like take a week off, you know, uh, you know, can cause relationship issues, right? If you, maybe your partner doesn't want you to go away. Um, it's one of the reasons we only do one big meetup a year. We used to do two. Uh, you know, realize that was too much. Um, another mistake we've made uh, several times and still struggle with actually uh, is is making sure that for that week that we're away, there's like no work that's going to intrude on anyone's like ability to take part in the event. Uh, too often in the past, we've ended up with like someone or some small group who just uh, like for whatever reason, maybe a client project's run over, there's been an emergency, what have you, like sometimes unavoidable. Um, and so they end up like having to sit in the corner and, and, and crank out work while everyone else is like taking part in the retreat. That's really sucky. Um, and those people just end up like inevitably even more burnt out because like now they're at a retreat also trying to do work. Um, burnout in general, I, you know, retreats often actually contribute to burnout because inevitably you're trying to pack so much into your time together and you're traveling halfway around the world probably to get there. So everyone's jet lagged. Um, and then when you get back, you're like a week behind on work. Um, so it, retreat, like the, the word retreat is probably a bit of a misnomer actually, you know, it, and, and uh, you need to factor in the fact that, 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 that there are going to be, uh, you know, a challenge for people to fit in often. Um, and so, you know, make sure people take time off afterwards, especially if you're running through, uh, running through the, um, uh, uh, the weekend. Um, so, 
so another um, challenge we had in the early days of, of, of human made um, was like how we handle time zones, especially with our transient teams. Um, and, and this, uh, you know, kind of came, 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 became pretty apparent a few years ago. When we were quite like an agency out in Australia. Um, and so we, we had this like group of people all on a similar time zone that was very different from our time zone over in GMT. Um, although we were kind of pretty spread out even at that point, we were still quite GMT based. Um, or, or, and, and, and so just this like, uh, how how do we how do we take account or or not take account for for time zones? Um, and so initially, our, our, you know, we kind of ignored time zones. Actually, and we were like we had this like uh, you know purest thought that like time zones don't matter. We're so great at asynchronous working. Um, you know, people, we're just going to form teams. Doesn't matter where they are in the world. They'll be able to work together. Um, and and uh, and and that was was a huge challenge. Um, obviously, <laughs> looking back. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and it, I think my primary driver there was just I really didn't want to end up with like multiple sub like geographic groups who were, you know, who I wanted like human made to be one global thing, not human made Australia and human made Europe and human made America. Um, and so we really, you know, in the early days thought that that was something we, we, we could do. Um, And so the 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 you know we quite quickly switched switched actually um, away from from ignoring time zones and and now we 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 kind of factor time zones in pretty heavily with when we're forming teams you know if we've got an Australian client it makes sense for the for the team to be Australian and for most of that team to be uh, have good overlap with that time zone. Um, I think the the. Um, like some, uh, another, I think another challenge we had with this idea of ignoring time zones is actually the majority of people were still in GMT. And so what that meant is that in effect, uh, like our, G our culture still actually quite f felt quite GMT centric, like our Slack channels were often quite out of hours. Um, and it was it, instead of this feeling of like you've joined a global company, um, people just felt like they joined like a UK company and maybe they had to work a bit harder to take part in the culture of that company, um, which again, wasn't really what we were going for. Um, so yeah, we started paying attention to time zones. Um, in order to, to, for us to avoid this problem of like teams being siloed by time zones, we focused on hiring more people like in the gaps between our people so that we'd have like a range of time zones coming online, dropping off, um, to, again, to kind of avoid this like two, two groups or, or there being like a day shift, night shift mentality. Um, and that really helped. Like now through the day, there's always someone coming online, there's someone dropping off, and it just feels much more like there's a 24 hour flow uh, to the work versus, versus multiple groups. Um, that's really nice. Um, also just more generally, I guess the company's grown to the point, um, you know, that we've got enough people to just to, to, to have that. Um, that also then just obviously helped our, our, our culture, like the, the GMT kind of portion of, of the company stopped having this uh, as much of like outsized ownership of our, of our culture, um, and, and, and how we did things, you know, and that's been really great to see. Um, and, and although our project teams are, tend to take account of time zones. We try and keep everything else like as global as possible, um, all our internal stuff, like basically stuff that isn't so deadline driven, where, you know, where, where time zones can really be, be, be a stress factor. Time zone differences can be a real stress factor when you're doing it to a time zone. Um, so all of our internal, like softer stuff, like our book clubs and, and uh, you know, our meet up meetings and stuff, uh, our internal hangouts, sorry, the video hangouts, those are like, you know, rotated and, and, uh, and much more inclusive. So there's obviously many challenges around communication and it's kind of become like a bit trite, I think, to say that like communication is the lifeblood of a remote company, but it's definitely true that remote work places a lot of additional communication burdens on the whole team. And I think it's important to recognize in the context of like stress in remote teams, that this communication really is like an additional burden on those people. Like it's not, it's, it, usually that communication is in itself work, right? Like you're expecting your iOS developers to build an iOS app just the same as, as if they were in an office, but now they've got to also do this remote communication um, like on top of that. Um, and so, you know, often I see that that just isn't factored in and, uh, you know, either, either to just like company structures themselves, but also just into individuals like expectations on them uh, or expectation of what they should be doing. Um, so something, you know, we've had to become more aware of. So the obvious thing, 
you know, the obvious solution to this is to just get really good at communicating everything. Um, so a human made, you know, if you're working, you've, you've got to communicate that uh, you've got, you, you've got to be on Slack and you've got to communicate to people that you're working. And um, if you're going to close Slack to like focus on something, you've got to make sure you tell your team you're doing it. You do not disturb uh, so that if someone does need to push through an emergency message, they can, um, uh, you know, when you're, you're documenting an aspect of your work, be overly verbose in that documentation, you know, whether it's a GitHub issue or pull request or some other form of, of like documentation. Um, and if someone has to like come back, I guess, to ask follow-up questions, like that's often just a sign that you weren't verbose enough in your communication. Like I really liked, J again, what Jason was talking about, uh, uh, like the downsides of chat um, and the importance of just like writing things up. Like uh, something, you know, again, uh, has been really important inside human aid. We have this like internal blog network, you know, blogs for each project and, and the, you know, it, things are written up there and can be communicated there with much more clarity, we found. Um, than than um, than than if they just happen through chat uh, and and then are lost kind of into the ether of time. I think the the you know without that stuff like the there's a lot of stress in remote teams with like interdependency. Um, like if you're relying on somebody else and you you know they're asleep and you can't or you can't communicate with them. And, but you need something from them, like that's a stressful position to be in. And maybe you send them a, a message, but then you don't know, like, have they read that message? When are they going to respond to that message? How long is it going to be until they get back to you with an answer? Um, and that's, a, you know, can be a, that's a stressful position then for you to be in. Um, but also then that person who maybe like is, is uh, out of hours, maybe they're out, uh, you know, at a social occasion, they get that message. For them, they're stressed. Do, do I need to respond now? Is that this an emergency? If I respond now, am I going to get pulled into something? Um, so there's this feeling of either needing always to be online so that you don't like let your teammates down. And then there's this guilt feeling on the other side of like, I don't want to ping people out of hours because I don't want to bring them back online. Um, and if you're not kind of, you know, you need to be to, to have good communication like structures in place so that um, you're not running into these issues or you're minimizing the, the like damaging effects of these issues. Um, So that solution of communicating everything and, and being like overly verbose in your communication inevitably leads to like communication overload. Um, we've, we've seen like that affect news people the most. Eventually people, as, as they've been here a while or just at remote companies a while, like get better at dealing with this. Um, but it's a huge problem for new people. Like new stars coming into human made often have this expectation built in that they just need to keep up with everything across the company. Like everything's transparent. They can join every chat Slack channel if they want. They can join every P2 blog and they can like read every notification. Um, and inevitably then they just either get burnt out because they're doing all their work and then they're reading up on all of the communication like backlog um, and you know, all evening uh, or weekend or whatever. Um, or they fall into this trap of like, thinking that that communication is, is, in, is in itself work and thus never really getting to actual work. Like they'll spend half of every day just reading backlog on stuff they don't actually really need to, to, to read. Um, so, you know, for us, we've got like an internal handbook. We have very specific guidelines on like the notification preferences. Um, a lot of it's just about like reinforcing that expectation that, hey, we don't expect you to have notifications for everything. It's okay to, to uh, have do not disturb out of hours. In fact, that's what you should be doing. Um, and it's something I talk a lot of, to new starters about in like my one-to-ones with them. I think one natural challenge there though is like as you yourself become better at dealing with this stuff inevitably you just lose touch with with like how bad it is for new starters like sometimes i'll walk over to a, to a new starters laptop at like a meetup or something and they get like in in you know 100 slack channels and they're getting notifications for everything and i'm like oh my god that's terrible you know quick let me help you deal with this um you know it's a bit of a wake-up call uh probably i'm running a little late on time so i might skip this and just go straight to yes. you, you, you jumped in then Daphne are you, yeah, are you stopping are me here finally, but no it's honestly if you want to I'm sure everybody okay, well, I'll just wrap up. I mean it's yeah. very interesting about I think your things are interesting so go you know you can finish up and sure oh it's all good don't worry Cool. Okay. No worries. Well, I'll just uh, close then on uh, like a few other things that, that have worked for human made. Um, so let me just skip forward. Here we go. Um, so yeah, what worked for human made? Uh, kind of five things that, that, um, that, that I've picked out uh, to share. Um, so the first, which again, a little, a little less specific and, 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 and probably something that needs to pervade like everything you do, 
Um, but that's just this sense of autonomy, like uh, working remotely is best paired with like increased autonomy, people who are good at working autonomously. Those, like, those that affect it are effective at taking responsibility for the work they're doing and how they'll do it tend to thrive in a remote environment. In, our, in my experience or in our experience. And then those that kind of need more direct supervision and direction are likely to struggle just with the amount of self-reliance that real work like inevitably requires of you. Um, and so we have this culture just kind of built around that concept, concept of like responsibility and empowerment. Everyone's encouraged to take executive decisions. And it's just this like sense of, of a like deal when you join Human Made that you're kind of being handed this increased level of, of freedom um, and autonomy. But in return for that, you have to take responsibility, right, for that. Um, you can't rely on somebody else, like a manager, having responsibility. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's really key, uh, we found, or I finally found, it's really key to, like, make sure that that is, is very clear um, so that then this, uh, you, 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 this, like, misalignment of expectations doesn't kind of uh, come back to bite you later on. Um, that kind of goes hand in hand then naturally with, with just the, the, how vital trust is uh, as like a, a, a core tenet of, of, of how you work. Um, like autonomous, responsible people require that you, you then obviously trust them and, and get out of their way and let them do the work in the way that they want. Um, for me, you know, as a founder, that's kind of meant like not micromanaging people or really trying hard not to micromanage people, even if that means maybe like watching someone fail a few times or do something as like not as well as, as you think they could. Like, you, you know, you have to take that longer view um, in terms of like the autonomous, responsible uh, person you want them to become. Um, you have to obviously then, you know, allow people to earn their successes too. Um, and, and ensuring that like failure is as productive an experience as possible. Obviously, you know, people failing can be really negative. So you've got to help turn that into, product, into a productive experience. Um, and then just this sense of like helping people make decisions rather than making them for them. Like I spend a lot of time like getting asked to make decisions on things and then just doing my best to like not make that decision for the person, but instead just like advise them or give them the information or the data that they would need to make that decision. Like what is the, what's the reason that you can't make this decision yourself and how can I fix that rather than just making the decision for you? And, and often that's just really simple things like, hey, can I expense X? Um, and I'll be like, well, you know, talk to them about, about expect why, why they uh, feel they need to ask about that and can't just you know, make that decision themselves to like, hey, can I attend this conference, you know, whatever. Um, something else that I do at Human Made, which has been really valuable for me uh, as a founder is I still to this day do one-to-ones with everyone in the company every month. Um, you know, obviously it doesn't scale forever. And even now it's like two or three a day that ends up being most days. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of time and, 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 and takes a lot of my focus. Um, for me, it's been incredibly important in like making sure that I actually have like a, a reality check on what is going on in, the, in our company, right? And what our culture actually is. Like I talk to a lot of founders who talk about how great their culture is, but then like, I also know that I talk to a lot of people who work, uh, you know, in companies and talk disparagingly about like where they work, right? Like a lot of people work for companies uh, and, and, and are, aren't that happy. Um, and so there's this like disconnect, right? Between what the cult, like the culture that maybe you think you've got as a founder or that you want and like whatever your actual culture is. Um, and I really want to know like what our actual culture is because otherwise how can I like, uh, you know, make it better over time. Um, so inevitably they're not going to scale, but something I'd really encourage you to do, like even if you're only, uh, you know, five people, like have those one-to-ones every month, um, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I just learned so much uh, once I started doing those. I probably started doing them when we were like 10 people or something. Um, another simple one we have, this, this idea of a remote work allowance, um, which like, you know, pe people, people are, are kind of like uh, encouraged to just make the decisions on what's expensable anyway. So in theory, we kind of shouldn't need this because everyone can, can just expense whatever they, they think they want. But um, we found by being explicit that like you're supposed to spend money on this stuff, that's really helped people then do that. Um, so just the idea that like working remotely, um, you know, like if you're expecting people to take responsibility for working effectively remotely, then you've got to make sure that they have like just the basics they need to do that. So maybe like better internet at home, um, maybe so they can buy some coffee so they don't get kicked out of Starbucks, uh, maybe get a lounge upgrade so they can get some power. Again, just like giving people the money and letting them uh, make the decisions as to how best that's going to fit within whatever their like local context is. Uh, it's been really, really useful. Um, 
and you know again cuts down on the amount of uh, decisions that are going to like bubble up to you um the last one i think quite broad um but it, another kind of mistake we've made over and over again and so, like something i think probably it, you know we've got the furthest to go probably with this um and that's just this like mis this misnomer i suppose that that being like having a flat architecture, a flat management structure, being autonomous and, and self-reliant and everyone just getting on and doing work um, somehow means that like as a company, you don't really need to bother with policies and procedures um, for things. Um, and we've just really found that to like over to not be true over time. And like it's definitely important to not get bogged down in like over prescribing how people should work. But um, for people to like when you give someone a responsibility for them to be able to like act with confidence in how they deliver that on that responsibility like they need to know uh the unwritten rules right uh, and they and they need to know like what's going to happen if they get sick or if they have a baby um or like w what things you're going to be uh, annoyed with them for not doing or doing um and inevitably they exist and so you're you know you, you're better off documenting them um and clearly explaining them to people so we put a lot of work into like uh, discussing and writing and rewriting our HR policies. You know, HR policies are probably a whole talk that we could do just on re on remote companies, especially if you're uh, like extremely remote and you know spreading all, all across the world. Each country has often has different like statute requirements and and uh, convention like you know best practice or whatever. Um, and so we you know we while we don't like HR and that we treat everybody. Uh, you know, uh, with the same benefits, and, and again, our salaries are, are uh, standardized globally in, in the sense that we're not paying people based on where the location is. Um, and so that, that just takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to discuss all that internally and write it and agree on stuff and then make sure that that like matches the legal requirements of all the countries you're doing business in, all that kind of stuff. But, but super important, I think, to get that stuff uh, like clearly documented. And similarly, uh, you know, with your communication expectations, with the, the like, expectations you have on, uh, in terms of like the goals of whatever it is people uh, are, are working towards, like that stuff is still super important that that stuff's clear, even if you don't have like clear, uh, uh, like overly prescribed policies around expense, like people still need to have it documented, like that they can expense things and what the process for that is uh, or, or whatnot. Um, okay, so that, you know, five, five little things, I guess, um, you know, that, 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 that have been, been, been important at Human Made. Um, final thing I just wanted to plug at the end, uh, which is that, um, you know, through this work we've been doing with Catalina, uh, the master's, master's student as part of her thesis, um, and also just, just internally, we've kind of put together uh, a white paper, um, which touches on a lot of the uh, stuff I've been talking about, but goes into a lot more detail into like the research and the findings uh, and, and you know, references, actual research and stuff. Um, so I think we're releasing that today, like maybe now, I think. So if you go to that URL, uh, you should get, get the white paper. Um, I guess it's like an ebook. Uh, you know, uh, people maybe aren't familiar with the term white paper. Um, and we're also releasing its contents under Creative Commons. Um, so you can take bits from it, uh, use them, copy them, uh, you know, build, build it into your own uh, uh, company handbook or whatever. Um, so yeah, really excited to release that. Uh, and yeah, just wanted to kind of plug it. Hey, Daphne. Thank Sorry you. for going you. That was really amazing. I think everybody is really happy that you didn't skip your section. It was really interesting. Well, actually, I did still skip a section. Oh. And I cut like five sessions before the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, my initial presentation must have been like two hours. <laughs> Next time is going to be only about, about stress on remote teams. And in the end, there is a lot of right, things right. to cover anyway on that topic. So, it's definitely something very oh, good. Yeah, let's get the, uh, see the questions then. Oh, cool. yeah. So the, um, so, the link is currently uh, in the live chat if you want to go and have a look at the white paper. It's really interesting, honestly, I would tell everyone uh, to go have a look um, to have had like Catalina and our team um, present and doing all this research was really valuable. And um, it's, uh, it's a really nice uh, white paper in the end that uh, the result that is done from that. Really amazing. Yeah, and huge plug to Catalina and, you know, uh, for, for, for that research and Chiffon for writing the, the white paper. I know I'm the one up here uh, getting to talk about this, but I really don't deserve the credit for, for putting any of that together. That's uh, or, you know, a lot of work on their parts. Good, good. I'm going to just uh, turn off your um, screen. I can keep you on screen anyway. Sure. Uh, since we are in the end, and then anyway, it's a human made event, so it's cool that we are together on the screen to mm -hmm. thank everyone for awesome. attending. It was a really nice event. It's really, really impressive how many people have been uh, joining us today uh, for, for the first edition of Out of Office. So we're really thankful for that. 
it's also showing that with all the people that we, ha we are today, that we really need to continue talking about remote work. We're really a movement. There is something that is happening where people really want to be more flexible in their work. And you can really see it with uh, the amount of people that came in today. So I'd like to thank everybody. Yeah, I thank you, Tom, for, uh, for being here today. And also thank Jason, Jennifer, uh, Rudolph, and Dino for uh, joining us today and giving their uh, talk and sharing their knowledge uh, with us. Um, I also like to thank, I'm going to show you everybody has been helping us for the event. I'm going to focus on the screen only. So these are everyone who's been helping us to make this event um, live. So like, they talked about the event, they shared the event, they make sure we would have as many people uh, watching the event today. We're really happy. So we really like to thank everyone that is uh, here. And uh, at the bottom, you see all the co-working space that have been um, streaming the event in their space so we're very happy and we really appreciate all this help that have been, have been given by the community so i'd like to come back now um on us uh, tom i'm gonna turn off this and this here and the last thing everyone if you could give us feedback so we really want to have feedback from you because this is really how we can make this event better and better this is the first edition and we really want to make more of these so if you could answer, we, we built a little quick uh, feedback survey that you can answer. I think somebody will, will paste it in the live chat right now. And we're also going to, yes, so Anna just posted the uh, survey here to so give us some feedback. It's a really quick survey. It will really help us to get to know like what you like better, what you didn't like, what you would like differently next time, and uh, maybe have a little testimonial as well if you really like the event. So please give us feedback and uh, we'll send it to you by email, if anything, in the next few days. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. It was really, really amazing to have you today. Uh, I hope uh, we will see you again for another edition of Out of Office. Bye, everyone. It's over. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm really, really happy. Thank you.